today our speaker uh, is Joseph uh, Lambreras Zarapico, and uh, uh, he's gonna show us uh, his results on multi armed quantum bandits, exploration versus exploitation when learning properties of quantum states. So please go ahead. Thank you. First of all, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, I'm going to present uh, what last work of uh, the term quantum bandits on the healthy bandit CQT with, uh, yeah, with Erka and Professor Mark. So, okay, let me start before uh, with the classical bandit uh, problem. I will give you uh, an example of what is a problem. So, in this example, suppose that uh, we are in a casino and we have slot machines. And what we want to do is we want to play the slot machine that in expectation give us the, the highest reward. In order to do that, what we should do, we should explore all the slot machines because they follow slightly different probability uh, distributions. And we want to do, uh, to do that in a way that we, uh, apart from exploring, we also uh, explode uh, those slot machines that apparently are giving us uh, high rewards because we are uh, losing money. So the multi-armed bandit problem is a trade-loss between exploration and uh, exploitation. Sorry, I, I think your, your audio goes away sometimes. So maybe if you can put your microphone in front. Uh, okay. Now better? Yes, 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 much better. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the multi-armed bandit problem is a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. We want to explore all, all these machines, but at the same time, where we are exploring, we want to explode those that are giving us the highest reward. So now I'm going to describe more formally uh, this problem. So I'm going to describe a discrete uh, multi arm stochastic bandit. So given a set of unknown uh, probability distributions, uh, PI that I labeled from uh, K, uh, we have a learner that over uh, n rounds uh, interacts with this probability distributions choosing an action that I, uh, that I denote as AT and samples a reward. It means that in the previous example, for example, choose uh, chooses one of the K slot machines, um, samples a reward and the reward follows a, a certain probability distribution that is uh, unknown to, to the learner. And uh, the objective of the learner is to, is to try to minimize the expected uh, cumulative re regret that is the figure of merit that we use uh, in order to quantify uh, this learning uh, process and is de defined as, as follows. It's a sum over n rounds, so the rounds where the learner is interacted with the, uh, with the ba bandit, so these are uh, probability distributions unknown. And it's uh, the difference between the maximum expectation value of, of these probability distributions minus the expectation value of the probability distribution that we are uh, choosing a time step uh, t. So this quantifies the relative loss uh, at each round. So if we are playing the, the best machine, so the machine with highest expectation value, the, the, uh, the regret at this round uh, will be zero. So this is the quantity that we use uh, in order to quantify uh, how a learner uh, le learns a, a multi uh, stochastic bandit. So it's a simple model of decision making uh, with uncertainty. And the important thing is that it's a trade-off between uh, exploration and, and exploitation. So some examples is, for example, the previous one that I gave about the slot machines, but there are a lot of uh, real situations that you can think about uh, as a bandit, for example, uh, restaurant selection. Uh, for, because for example, if this night I want to go for a dinner, I can try to explore uh, uh, new places uh, at the cost that uh, I don't know if they are going to be good or not, or, or I can try to explode those places that I already know that uh, they are good. Or for example, they they are loose also, or they are also using online uh, advertisements, so like recommendation, uh, see, online recommendation systems. So, okay, this is the classical setting. And now I'm going to describe what we did in our work. So in our work, what, what we did is we formulated a one to learn task in terms of, uh, a multi armed stochastic bandit. So now I'm going to describe the, the setting of uh, about how we define a multi armed quantum bandit. So the model is described by uh, two things. One is a set of uh, quantum states. Um, 
that is what uh, I will call an uh, environment. And another is a, a set of observables, that is what I uh, call uh, actions. Um, for observables, I mean uh, just uh, hermitian operators acting on some uh, space. So the model is described by the set of environments and the set of observables. And we differentiate between uh, two types of bandits. Bandits with discrete and finite action set. So it means that we have a finite amount of observables. So I will use the, uh, the K in order to denote, the, as before, the number of uh, of actions or several in this case. And also uh, we consider continuous action sets. Uh, for example, the, example uh, the, the case that we study is when the action is comprised of all rank one projectors. So the important thing from this slide and to keep in mind is that the, the, bandit, the quantum bandit problem is characterized by the tuple of, uh, of actions and environments. Okay, so now how the, uh, the learner interacts with the, uh, with the quantum bandit. So the learner interacts in the following way. Uh, over n rounds, uh, so there is an unknown state uh, to, the, uh, to the learner that is taken from the set of, uh, from, from the environment. And the learner interacts over n rounds, uh, choosing at each round uh, an observable from the action set, performing a measurement and receiving a reward uh, sample from the probability distri uh, distribution associated to to the known state and the observable that is selecting at time step t. So in analogy with the example uh, before, uh, before we were selecting, for example, slot machines, now what we are selecting is, um, is observables and we are performing a measurement and sampling a, a reward. So the learner choice is determined by a policy. A policy is just uh, how we denote the, um, the strategy followed by the learner in this, in this game. And a policy is an al algorithm that is a set of priority distribution over all rounds of the following form. That, so it's a um, probability distribution over the set of, of, of actions that is going to tell you the, uh, the observable that you are going to pick at, uh, at the time step, given all the previous information. So given all the previous observables that, that you have played and the, and the reward that you have uh, received. So this is how the bandit game works. So we have Oracle access to no quantum state. We perform on a measurement, uh, OT, that uh, we can choose from the, from the action set. We receive a reward. And then we will use this information in order to, dec to decide in the next round which uh, observable are we going uh, to be. So which is the goal of the, the, the learner. So as before, the learner wants to find the action that in observable in action set that in expectation maximizes the reward. So it means that wants to find um, uh, the observable with highest overlap with this unknown uh, quantum state, but in a way that it minimizes the expected cum uh, cumulative re regret. So the learner wants to minimize the, the following quantity that is the same that I showed you before, but in this setting. So it's a sum over uh, n rounds, and it depends on the action set on the unknown. Uh, quantum state and the strategy that is this pi. And it's the difference as before of the expectation value of the, uh, of the highest um, action, in this case, the, the, the observable that maximizes the, throw, the trace of uh, rho and, and O, minus the expectation um, of the observable that, uh, that we are playing at uh, time step t. So it's uh, th this trace of uh, rho OT. Well, this, okay, this OT should be 80. But about the action. And here I'm taking ex expectation because uh, this OT is a, a random variable that is determined by this strategy. So, okay, so many special cases of the regret. Okay, well, first of all, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about the regret uh, from now. So I want to make sure that everyone is following. So you have any question about this, uh, this figure of merit, the regret, please ask me before I can speak. Not I just go. Okay. So this regret has uh, some um, some implications in some special cases. One, for example, is, is, the, is the action set contains all rank one projectors. Then minimizing the regret in, implies uh, finding finding the maximum eigenvector of, of rho. And actually, the case that we are more interested in is. Uh, when the unknown state is, is raw, uh, I, when the known state is, uh, is pure and also the action set contains all rank one projectors, then we can reformulate the regret uh, as follows, which is a simple uh, 
uh, computation, but it's a, a sum, again, as a sum over the n rounds, but now it's the expectation of the trace distance between the unknown state and the rank one uh, projector. And here, finding the, the best observable implies uh, finding the exact uh, quantum state. Why? Because the, now, since uh, the action set contains all rank one projectors, the same state is contained in the, in the action set. So here, minimizing the regret, um, it's like doing online quantum state uh, tomography, but in a different way, because we are at each round, we want to be, like, uh, we want to be optimal. So in the difference with, with tomography in this setting is that in tomography, you don't care about this exploitation. So it's, you can think just as exploration because you perform, uh, typically what you perform is a, a set of um, orthogonal, uh, a set of orthogonal uh, measurements. And, and then we, uh, you collect the data and you find, and you reconstruct your state. But here it's different because at each round, we want to choose the uh, observable that uh, apparently has the highest overlap with the, with the normal state. So, okay, but uh, from now, the, the regret that I've been formulating it's in terms of this unknown state, but what I want to do is uh, to give a quantity that is independent of the state, it's, and it just tells you how difficult it is a uh, similar task. So in order to do that, uh, what we define is the worst case regret. So given a set of density matrices, that is the environment, we define the worst case regret as follows. It's just the supremum over, um, uh, over a fixed strategy, an action set, over all uh, possible re regrets where the supremum is taken uh, over the all possible uh, unknown quantum states. And this quantity tells us how well uh, a policy performs uh, for a given set of uh, environments. And then the quantity that we study in our work is, this, is the minimax regret. This is defined as the infimum over, um, where the infimum is taken over all possible policies of the worst case regret. So this quantity actually tells you how difficult is the problem uh, given by, just by the in environment and the action set in a worst case scenario. So it's a independent uh, quantity for, from the policy and it quantifies the, the difficulty of the, of the learning task. Okay, so the goal of our work is to give bounds on the minimax regret for different uh, environments and set of actions, observables, in terms of the number of rounds and the dimension of the Hilbert space. So we give uh, lower bounds and upper bounds of this uh, minimax regret. And for the lower ones, we use information theoretic techniques. And for the upper ones, uh, we use an algorithmic approach, which means that uh, we find a strategy, an algorithm, and we um, calculate an upper bound of, uh, of this strategy uh, in a given setting of, of the data. So an important thing to remark of, uh, of our work is that uh, the multi-arm quantum bandit falls in the class of linear stochastic bandits. So what are linear stochastic bandits? Is well, they, in the classical literature, there is the general problem of bandits that I mentioned before, but there are a lot of variants of this problem. There are also adversarial band bandits, but as a subclass of stochastic bandits. Um, and we have uh, linear uh, bandits that are, are just um, bandits such that there is an, a known vector in a real space. And each action is also associated, uh, associated to an, uh, a known real uh, vector. And then the expected reward in, is linear in the sense that uh, it's, it's given by the inner product of an unknown vector and a vector associated to its action. And here you can see why, well, I, I will give the details later, but why our problem falls in this class, because uh, our expectation values are given by the trace of uh, the known state and an observable. And this can be vectorized and, and can be given also as an inner product of uh, two uh, real vectors. And okay, then uh, why, uh, what's different uh, from, our work, from our work? So first of all, classical lower bounds uh, do not apply to the quantum case. Why? Because they try to find hard cases where every policy, every learner performs badly. So in the quantum case, there is not an analog of these classical cases. So you need to find the quantum cases and, and our work, we develop new techniques in order to analyze these uh, lower bounds. And then in the upper bounds, uh, it's different. Because for the upper bounds, you can apply the algorithms because our problem is like a subclass of uh, linear uh, bandits. 
but we have more structure because we have that the uh, we have the quantum structure so that the unknown state is uh, the quantum state and the observable uh, also are emission operators. So since it's a restricted class, class um, our we would try to identify algorithms that perform better than the classical uh, algorithms when we apply uh, them to, to our problem. So, okay, now I'm going to- Sorry, just a, just a question on the model. So like, yeah. if I understand correctly, the gamma is the set of multi-armed bandits basically. Well, it is uh, a set of bandits, so it, and so you don't know it, when. You think this gamma that uh, here? Um, gamma? Yeah, yeah, the set of quantum states. But so. Um, yes. So gamma is the set where. Uh, so you don't know which state you are given. Yeah. Typically, what okay. we are going to do is just. We could, we're going to consider this set as all quantum states first, and then we are going to go to more restrict settings like pure states. Ah, uh -huh. okay, okay. Because this tells you already some information about what are your unknown states. You can consider general states, or if you go like, for example, pure state, you know that you have more structure, so your strategy have to will take advantage of the uh, known structure that uh, that you already have. But, but, but it's described by this environment and actions. It, it is characterized by, the, by this tuple. In realistic scenarios, should I imagine this set to be like 10 or 100 or? In a, a realistic yeah. scenario. Uh, yeah. You can think, well, okay, this is a simple example. For, 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 you can have, for example, a, a photon that is coming to you and you have like some polarizer. And what you try to do here is you are trying to find like the direction with which uh, the photon is polarized. So here you can think, for example, as a photon being a pure state and your actions being all run one projector because you are like trying to rotate uh -huh. uh, like the polarizer. And you can do it in a way such that you are like doing tomography. You, you, so you perform like orthogonal measurements, but this is a very unnatural way to do it in a, like in, in practice. What you're going to do is like a radio. You are going to tune Ah. and you find the correct direction. So this is okay. Uh, okay. a way to understand the, the bandit setting, no? because you are continuously switching in a way that you are minimizing the reg this regret and at each round. Okay, okay, okay. Example where you can see. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to give us uh, some of the results of our work. And I'm going to start giving a lower bounds, and I'm going to start uh, studying the more general case that uh, we study. So in this general case, we consider uh, that the environment, so the set, set of unknown quantum states, it can be any quantum state. And we consider first uh, discrete action sets. So uh, for example, K uh, different observables. And here, if we, don't, um, if we don't impose any condition on the action set, uh, we will achieve a trivial lower bound on the on this meaning max regret. Why? Uh, because the following reason, because if we, consider for, if we consider, for example, that we have an action set with two observables and one is greater than the other in a matrix sense, this implies that for any quantum state, uh, the trace of uh, one of the observables will be always greater than the, than the other. So there is a policy uh, that the policy that always chooses the, the first observable will achieve uh, zero regret because he is, uh, the policy is always uh, choosing the best observable. And remember that our minimax regret is defined as the minimization over all possible policies. So since we know that this policy exists, we know that we will achieve a minimax regret of, of, of zero because it's a minimization, minimization of over all possible policies. So we need to impose like some extra conditions on, on this uh, general case. And what we introduce is the domination con condition in order to avoid uh, happened in this example and we define uh, an observable that is domination dominating in an action set if uh, is the following happens if given its maximal eigenvector so the eigenvector of the observable with highest uh, eigenvalue we have that the overlap of this uh, observable with uh, the uh, with the this maximal eigenvector is always greater uh, strictly greater than uh, the overlap of the of this maximal eigenvector, but with any other uh, observable in the action set. 
this is a condition that we will impose in our uh, in, in our action set that the that, that this dominating observable has to exist. And this is the first result result of uh, our work is that is we consider a discrete multi arm quantum multi problem then for uh, d greater or equal to two where the action set is comprised of uh, three phase observables but this is a normalization condition that we do in our calculation and contains at least two dominating observables then the minimum actually rate satisfies the following it uh, we have that the lower bound scale as square root of n and Okay, this is the first general result, and here we don't have like a dependence on the dimension or or the uh, or the number of observables, but this is because we didn't impose a uh, major structure in the action set. And now I'm going to give you another result that uh, has this dependence. So, okay, if we have time, I will go over the proof, uh, some of well, the sketch of the proof of uh, these results, and that this will be at the end of the talk. So, let me skip now this sketch of the proof and yeah, let, let's go to another result so now we consider also a discrete multi quantum bandit uh, where the action set will be given by tensor uh, products of elementary poly matrices so for example here i wrote an example in v equal to four so it's just tensor product of uh, a poly matrices and, and the action set contains the, uh, in the action set, then we can give a following minimax regret, uh, following lower bound that it escapes as, as before, a square root of n, but now uh, we can introduce the number of observables, so k, uh, k, and why k minus one? Uh, where the minus one is, uh, it's because if you have only one observable, you, can, you will always play optimal this game, so the regret will be always at zero. So that's why you have the, the minus one. Uh, but here we already introduced the, uh, a dependence on the number of, uh, of observables. And well, as, as, as you know, you can have at most uh, d squared different, uh, of, the, of d squared different uh, elements on this action set, uh, because it's a maximum number of different uh, poly matrices that you can have. So, also, this gives a dimensional dependence of this minimax uh, regret that it scales as you have this square, so the d goes out of so the square root of n. And then, if we move to continuous action sets, we have the following: uh, that if we consider a general multi arm quantum bandit problem, when the, when the action set consists of all rank one projectors in d dimensions, then the minimax, uh, minimax regret can be bounded as uh, again a, a square root of n. Uh, but here there is the first, well, one of the first open problems of our work. It's, uh, well, it's a tech, more a technical problem about how to introduce the, uh, the dimensional dependence. So, because here, uh, what we expect, but well, uh, we, we, I think that we are, we are very confident that there is a dimensional dependence in this, in this lower bound, but with our uh, current techniques, uh, we cannot uh, do that. So yeah, this is one of the open problems of our work to, to introduce a dimensional dependence in this. Uh, the continuous case. So, okay. And now I commented uh, some of the results in lower bounds. So now I will go to the upper bounds. So in order to do that, I'm going to describe uh, some cl classical strategy that works uh, in these uh, quantum bandits. So in the classical, well, there are different classical strategies that we consider, but the most general one is this lean UCB algorithm, that it means linear Upper confident bound. Uh, now we will explain why. Well, lean because the problem is linear. And upper confident bound, it's uh, because it uses, it's the, uh, well, because in bandits you have like optimistic algorithms uh, that, well, and now I'm going to explain why. So, first of all, what we are going to do is to vectorize our problem because this is a classical algorithm. Uh, so, it's formulated in terms of vectors. So, in order to do that, what we do, is we choose some orthonormal basis of Hertzmichian matrices, and then we express uh, the unknown state and action as following. So it can be thought as the inner product of a real vector, and and the and, and the and the and the basis of, of, of matrices, and and then the mean of each action instead of uh, instead of uh, compute that can be computed as a as a trace of the row and the and the observable. Now it's, it will be given by the inner product. 
of uh, zeta and a, a, where zeta is a vector that parameterizes the known state, and ai is a real vector um, that parameterizes the, uh, the observable. So, okay, we have uh, this parameterization in terms of vectors, and now I'm going to describe how the algorithm works. So at round t, what the algorithm works is the following. First, it builds a, a least square uh, estimator. So after observing the, the rewards and the observers that the algorithm has played, the algorithm tries to approximate the, the known state uh, with, the, with the least square estimator. Uh, well, here we have the zeta hat because it, it approximates the vector that parameterizes the, the state. And this is just the formula for the least square uh, estimator. Okay. Um, that you can recognize here that they have the, the reward minus the expectation of the of the reward in terms of these vectors, and the the extra term is just a regularized term okay, because this is a regularized least square estimator, and this last term just ensures that this uh, estimator uh, has a minimum. Actually, if you play enough actions such that they span all the all the vector space, uh, you can say this lambda parameter uh, to zero, this minimum will exist. So, okay, the, the algorithm builds uh, this uh, estimator. This can be computed efficiently, actually. It has a closed form. It builds a confident region about uh, this estimator. So, and the confident region uh, works uh, as follows. So, it's an uh, ellipsoid. And why an ellipsoid? Because the, 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 the axes of the ellipse uh, that, that are larger are those ones corresponding to the directions in the vector space that you have explored less. So it means that you are uh, less confident and you give uh, more uncertainty. And those ones that uh, are more narrow, it means that they are, these are the directions that you have explored more, so the directions that you have collected uh, more statistics, so those ones that you are more confident. So this, this is why you have uh, this kind of ellipsoid uh, confident region. In tomography, you can think that if you explore equally the number uh, in equal the number of observable and in, orth in some orthogonal uh, basis, then instead of an ellipsoid, you will have a, just a, uh, like a sphere or, or a circle in all these dimensions. So, okay, when they are in, and then the algorithm works as follows. Uh, at each round, the algorithm builds uh, this confident region and then chooses the, uh, the action that, uh, uh, that, uh, that maximizes the following quantities. So the expectation over all possible actions and uh, known states on this confident region. And when it has selected uh, this action, uh, that is a, this a vector, then selects the, the observable and observes the reward, and then uh, updates uh, the confident region. First thing to notice here is that this estimator doesn't need to be uh, a quantum state, but uh, the algorithm uh, the algorithm is, uh, still works it, because it, it will play the uh, with, it will play the, the the observable that has more that has more confidence that is uh, the best one. So that's the reason why they, these are called like up, uh, optimistic algorithms because you will be your uh, that your uh, unknown state is. So okay, this is just a classic algorithm, and what the results uh, tells us um, is that um, the regret analysis uh, shows uh, that the an upper bound. That escapes as square root of n and well and some log uh, term and and then a dimension uh, a d square so this is a dimensional dependent of, uh, that we find and one of the questions is can we find a better uh, quantum version of the linear cv uh, algorithm um, the, this question arises naturally because we here we are not like not ex exploiting all the quantum structure but now we will see that actually uh bounds given by classical algorithms uh, match uh, the lower bounds, except uh, in some special cases. So for the general environments, we have uh, the following results. We, con we have considered discrete and continuous action set. And for the discrete case, you can consider amp-limited and dimension-limited bandits. Amp-limited means that you have less observables than the d square, so where d square is just the dimension of the vector space. Or dimension limited, it means that you have more observables than than this square. And in these cases, the lower bounds and upper bounds uh, match, not by the strategy that I showed you before, but there are some other strategies that can be implemented. They are also based in this confident, in these optimistic algorithms. But okay, for the discrete 
case we can match the, the, the lower and the, and the upper bounds. And then what we cannot match, as I mentioned before, is that uh, in the continuous case, we have a lower bound that scales as square root of n, but we don't have like this dimensional dependence. And, when, and if you apply like linear CB in this, in this setting, it gives uh, this D square. So this is what uh, we have for general environments. So here we don't have anything new because we see that classical strategies uh, work uh, um, for this case. But what we, where we identified uh, a setting where we can find like uh, better, uh, better strategies is in, the, in, in a restricted setting where the environments are uh, pure states. So let me go now through the results. So, okay, now what we uh, will consider is a restricted setting of environments. So it will be the set of uh, pure states. And if we consider uh, uh, first uh, discrete bandits, we already uh, find that the, uh, the and a square root, root of n dependence on a lower bound. So here we don't have anything new. Uh, the, the example that we give in the paper is um, it's in a qubit case where the action set is the uh, three poly matrices. So here we can compute analytic as uh, lower bound and square root of n, so nothing new here. And um, what is new is uh, in, in the setting where apart from the environment being uh, pure states, we have that the action contains, uh, it's a continuous set, it contains all rank one projectors. Uh, because then, in, as I mentioned before, the regret can be formulated as uh, the square uh, expected the square uh, trace distance, and okay. In in this setting, we are unable to pro uh, to prove a non-trivial lower bound. Um, okay, now we are starting to realize uh, what are the problems. So, and and actually, in new version that will appear in the paper, we might relate this the definition that I'm going to give you now that is this trace distance regret regret. But at the moment, in uh, at, at that moment, when we were doing uh, this work and we could provide this lower bound, we, we reformulated uh, another regret that is the following. That is the trace distance uh, regret, which the trace distance regret is just that the same regret as before, but with a square root. And now it's, it's just the sum over n rounds and the expected uh, trace distance without the square between the, the known state and the rank one projector that you are selecting at time step t. And well, this is a natural loss function in a, an, an online learning of, of quantum states. Uh, it just quantifies the trace distance between the, uh, the known state and uh, the interaction. And OK, in this setting, uh, we can prove a non-trivial lower bound. Um, actually, it scales as uh, a square root of n. Uh, but you have to be careful here, because it's not the same regret as before. So it's, it's still the regret that is this trace distance regret. So it's the square of the original uh, regret. Um, so, so yeah, here be careful because it's not the same type of square root of n. And now uh, what happens with the strategy? So we can apply li the linear CV algorithm to this setting. But if we analyze the resistant regret in this setting, instead of matching the lower bound that I showed you before, it will give an n3 over 4 for this trace distance regret. So actually, this is quite far from the square root of n that I showed you. And what we do is we analyze a, a variant of the, the call, the, the known strategy that is called explore then commit algorithm. And this variant gives a, an upper bound of n uh, 2 over 3. So this, is, this doesn't match the, the square root of n, but it's already better than in CB in this particular setting. And why they are called this explore then commit algorithm? It's because during uh, what we do in this type of strategies, first you just explore. So it means that you choose uh, uh, observables or actions that if they are going to give you uh, information about uh, about the, the, best, the best action. So here it's like in, in our setting, what we are going to do is we are going to do tomography. So during the, the first part of the algorithm, we are just going to play observables. That such that we can reconstruct with uh, high accuracy the, the non-state. And then during the remaining round, the second part of the, of the algorithm is the exploitation uh, phase. It is this commitment that once you know uh, some, 
estimate of your where your possible state is or which is going to be your best action you just choose this best action for the remaining rounds so this is what they are called explore uh, then commit so how do we do this algorithm so we use the project least square estimator from the following pair by by Mbuta, this phase state tomography with optimal bounds and the algorithm well as i mentioned before has two parts so during the first and two over three rounds we just measure uh, pol uh, poly observables and we collect the, the outcomes so we measure like the, uh, well actually okay i forgot to mention but this is uh, this algorithm works for qubits it's more well, for the technical uh, reason uh, but uh, yeah, during this first part, we just pay like different poly observables, so the x, y, and, and z, for example, and we collect the outcomes, and then we reconstruct the state with this PLS uh, estimator. And then, when we have the estimator uh, of the unknown state, remember that our st state is pure. This estimator is not going to be pure, but we project it to the nearest uh, pure state, and then this will be an action, and then is the action that we will commit for the remaining uh, rounds. So. Yeah, this is the and then this is the commitment of the of the algorithm. We'll play, play this uh, this estimate for the remaining uh, rounds. And uh, okay, okay, this is just how the the details of the algorithm how it works. But okay, you can see from here that it has just these first two rounds where first you uh, you explore and right? so you measure uh, all the circles, then you compute your uh, this ln is the, uh, the formula for the, the least square uh, estimator. Then you project it to the uh, this, uh, this second line of is that uh, this project the least square estimator. It's a least square estimator, but then it projects to the space of quantum states. And then what we do is we project it to the space of uh, pure states, and this will be our action for the remaining rounds. And okay, this is a summary of our results. Okay, the strategy that I mentioned you now is uh, give the a trace distance regret of n two over three, and it's better than linear CV. So okay, let me summarize a little the results. So we have uh, discrete bandits. So for discrete bandits, we don't have problems. We can match um, lower and upper bounds uh, with lower bounds that we use new techniques uh, in order to analyze the quantum case. And for the upper bound, we use classical algorithms. And then what we find some difficulties in the continuous case. So for general environments, remember that we have a lower bound of square root of n, but the upper bound, there is a dimensional dependence. So there is a, this is the first gap of our work, the introduction of the dimensional dependence in the lower bound. And then in the continuous case, where you, also, where you consider that the set of environments are uh, pure state, so we found a strategy that performs in, okay, remember that is in this trace distant regret. We found a strategy that performs better than uh, linear CV, but it's not, a, we think that it's uh, not optimal uh, for two reasons. One, we think that our, maybe uh, I think that our lower one is tight. And the other reason is because it's not very adaptive. The, the strategy that I'll show you, it just, actually it uses the, the quantum structure uh, but it's not very adaptive because first just explore and then then commits, and we we need a mix of, of both things. No, we need a mix of exploration exploitation plus exploitation of the quantum structure. Linux CV it's good because it explores and and explodes in a in a nice way, but doesn't use the quantum structure. And our strategy uses the quantum structure, but it's not very very adaptive like uh, Linux CV. So we have to combine these both things in order to to uh, close this gap. Um, so yeah, that's more or less uh, what I had. So if, well, if you want, I can give some of the sketch of the proof for uh, lower bounds where we use uh, like information theoretic techniques. Or otherwise, if people have questions, I can ask the question. Uh, no, there are no messages in the chat, so I think we can give a few techniques. Okay, so. Let's see how the lower one will work. Okay. So I'm going to comment you about some 
for every setting, there are some difficulties. So I'm going to give like the main steps that you have to do. And first of all, we one of the results that we use is this retinol haber inequality. Um, let's say the following, that it's given um, two probability measures on the same uh, P and Q on the same measurable space. And then we have one event A. Um, we have that the probability of P uh, of this event plus Q of the complementary event, this will be always greater than one half the exponential of minus the um, the divergence of P and Q, where this divergence is the, star, the standard pullback labeler divergence. So this is one of the technical tools uh, that we use. Uh, well, we actually derive new uh, tighter inequality that replaces this, uh, this divergence by uh, D one half, where D one half you can think as of the fidelity in, in the quantum case. So what we do, we, in order to prove the lower bounds, we need to consider like bad environments uh, that they will perform that uh, policy, that every policy will uh, will perform badly in those environments. So in order to do that, uh, we propose this environment. So we need to remember that environments are just unknown quantum states. So we propose, uh, first, remember that in, in the general setting, we can pick two dominating operators because of the requirement of the results. So we pick uh, two dominating operators. A and B, uh, with uh, with again back with the uh, with the following eigen vectors C A and C B, and propose the following state. So it's a convex combination of the completely limited state um, plus a perturbation where this perturbation that is parameterized by this delta uh, is in the direction of um, the the maximal eigen vectors. So this is the two possible uh, environments that we are going to analyze. Then we, either, we don't use, in, in this case, uh, the formula that I showed you before in the regret. This regret can be uh, well, actually is equal to the following, uh, the following expression. That instead of being a, a sum over n rounds, is a sum over uh, k, where k is the number of several that you have in, in, in your action set. And now it's a product of the expectation of, uh, the, of, of the random variable, where the random variable TIN is, remember that A labels an observable. So TIN, it means it's a var random variable that, one, that says the number of times that you have picked uh, observable I up to round N. So, the, so this quantity is the, expect, the expected number of times that you have uh, picked uh, the observable I. And this is multiplied by the what is called the subtimality gap of the observable I, that is the difference between the expectation of the maximum expectation value uh, and, the, and minus the expectation value of the observable OI. So this suboptimality gap quantifies the relative loss that, uh, of the corresponding to the observable OI, and this is multiplied by the one of the technical parts uh, that, you, that it's actually changes for, for every case that we analyze. So, we were, are going to compute a lower bound on the sum of the two regrets. So one of the environment A and one from the environment B. And here you have to separate uh, from the formula that I showed you before, uh, a different set of actions. And when you, and this separation uh, depends on the, uh, on the setting. But when you have uh, this separation, uh, so you lower bound this, uh, the, the quantity that I showed you before that depends on the number of actions by a set, but a subset of, of, of these actions, so this is still positive. So you do that, and then you you go from expectations to probabilities using a Markov inequality, and you will arrive to something like this. That is a uh, that the, the, the sum of the two regrets is lower lower bounded by uh, some quantity that it's uh, n delta, where delta is the is the, the, the quantity that can the quantify the perturbation that I showed you before in the, in the quantum states. And now the, the, the probabilities are the two complementary probabilities. Uh, so it, it means that the, the sum uh, where, where, I, I uh, where I use this uh, complementary uh, set of, of, of indices, 
And here the important thing is that um, I can apply the Bertrand-Haber inequality because I have complementary the two different the complementary uh, events. And then we use the Bertrand-Haber the, the inequality that I showed you before, combined uh, with data processing inequality because uh, we want to go to, from classical to, uh, to quantum. And actually, the important thing is that typically we can give a lower bound of the sum of the two regrets as, uh, that goes as follows as n delta um, and the, the, the exponential of minus n the, and the divergence of the two environments. So, and what remains to do now is to compute uh, the divergence of these two environments. Actually, this, well, these divergences can be, uh, for example, for pure states. Um, this cannot be the standard relative uh, quantum divergence. We don't know we need to go to the one half because it might, if the super is not contain one and the other, then this is infinite. But then that's why introduce like the, this D one half that is symmetric on, on both um, on both uh, on both arguments, just the fidelity of uh, both, well minus log the, the fidelity. And then the proof is completed uh, computing these divergence and showing that this divergence scales as as delta square, because then when you have that scale as delta square, you can set this uh, delta to go as one over square root of n, and then the quantity in the exponential will, uh, will vanish, and then in, in front it will remain a uh, n multiplied by one square root of n that is that gives the the square root of the square root of n that I've been showing in, in the results. Uh, well, this is more or less a, a sketch of how we do the proof. There are it, it, Obviously, in the continuous case, there are uh, some subtleties and difference because um, you need to go to the continuous and the formula of the regret that I showed you before, it's not the same. And also these suboptimality gaps, they can, uh, they are not finite, they can be uh, like very small. So yeah, there are like some uh, different techniques, but the main scheme is uh, more, more or less uh, this. So this is like the main parts uh, for the, for the so, okay, well, with this, I think it's all. So anyone has any question? Maybe as Marco is suggesting, like you can have a, one of the slides you had at the beginning with the main contributions, uh, the conclusion. So you can recall the main contributions. And maybe a question for me is like, if you can re-explain briefly uh, the classical algorithm, Ah, uh, yes, yeah, I can go. Uh, the linear CV, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, just think now that we have vectors, so which means that we have like a known, ve an, a known vector, and then your actions are, are, are vectors that you know, real vectors. So, and each action has some associated probability distribution, but the important thing is that the um, that, the, that the expectation of these of these probability distributions are given by the inner product of the uh, unknown vector and the and the and the vector that you are that you are choosing that is your action. So actually, uh, each action will uh, will be useful to you. Uh, also, so apart from um, um, Apart from uh, exploiting the, the best one, it will give you some information about the, the, known, the known vector. So what the, this strategy will try to do is two things. One, it will try to reconstruct the unknown vector. And the other thing, it will try to, uh, that when this is happening, so it, it's uh, reconstructing the known, the known vector, is also choosing like vectors that are, uh, that are optimal. So they ha that have a high overlap or high, uh, in a, so how how we can do that? So the strategy is first um, when you have placed uh, some actions, you have gained some information. So you can try to reconstruct this uh, this unknown parameter. And since these things are linear, you can use uh, the least square estimator that has a nice form. Well, least square estimator uh, can be used uh, in many settings, and this setting is quite good because yeah, it's linear, so it has a, like a closed form. So you compute the least square est uh, estimator of your unknown vector using all the previous information that, that you have uh, that you have observed. So the, the vector that you have placed and the reward that you have 
uh, the seeds. And once you have done this reconstruction of the of the uh, unknown parameter, which is an estimation, you build a confident region. But here you have to be careful because this is the one of the big challenges of this uh, this algorithm. Um, well, theoretically, now it's already done, so it's not not a challenge. But theoretically, one of the challenges was how, uh, was about how to construct a confident region. Typically, confident regions, um, if you think in tomography, they can be built quite easily if you play like orthogonal, orthogonal uh, measurements, or in, the, in this case, like orthogonal vectors, because they will correspond typically uh, to some sphere or circle. Um, but here, uh, the, the, the game is different. So you don't play the same number of times uh, the, all the different directions. Actually, you can ha have infinite. And the important thing here is how to construct these confident regions. And the, well, you can go to the, the mathematics of, of this, but uh, to summarize, this will be like a ellipsoid confident region of the unknown parameter. And in this ellipsoid confident region, well, the, the direction that is more large, it means that are, this corresponds to the directions, so the vectors that, for, that you have played less because you have play less, so you, have, you are less confident, so it has more uncertainty. So when you have this confident region where your possible state uh, uh, lies, what you are going to do is to play the action uh, that according to this confident region will give you the, the best reward. So and as, long, as long you keep the, uh, playing this game, the, the, this confident region, uh, will, the shape will, will change. But you always cho will choose your action uh, in terms of uh, in terms of this confident region uh, that uh, that that you are building. So here you can see that typically you uh, you cannot hope, like for example, to like to have like an, an even like a circle or an, an even an sphere, an, an even confident region, because this will always be shaped. Uh, well, will be an, an, an ellipsoid uh, because you are always trying to uh, play this uh, like, the, like the best action. So, well, this is how the, the, strategy, uh, like the strategy works. Uh, it's, it is uh, upper confidence strategy. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. So Thank you, Joseph. Hope to see you at CQT at some point.